think I just got addicted to that, that feel and the bend of that fiberglass rod, and then it's all, all downhill from, from there. Well, welcome to the Remote No Pressure Podcast. It's Jeff Trautman here, and I am with our co-host, Bill. Wild Bill. How are you, Bill? I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm doing so awesome. What did you think of today's interview? It was awesome. It was uh, really fascinating. Let me, let me ask you a question, Bill. Mm-hmm. If NASA could really control the weather, would you want to know? Uh, well, I think we should know because, uh, I mean, that could, that could be like devastating to other countries. That, that's like a weapon. I know. And you know what? I'm gonna put up I'm gonna put up a video on our on our blog at remotenopressure.com where this guy um, actually does go to this big power plant mm-hmm. and he makes a giant cloud that mm-hmm. creates rain. Did you see that? I have not, but I've I've heard uh, there's uh, two large uh, weather controlling stations throughout the world. I mean like Russia has one and we have one. It's not publicized, but like, well, I'm good. we're getting deep here. <laughs> Up in Alaska, Google Harp. Okay. And uh, America owns a large device up there, like acres big, uh, that is for, con- uh, you know, presumably for controlling the weather. We, we need to get Big Ty Shesky on here, the, the, the local weatherman, to tell us if there was any way we could possibly control the weather, could we control the hatches? Can we control the, the fish? Now we're talking. The pressure of the atmosphere. I mean, that's some stuff I could get behind, I think. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know? I mean, I don't want to bomb anybody or no. like control any... I mean, I just want to catch a decent fish. That's right. You know, any time of the year. You know, what would that be like? You go out to the backyard, you fire the thing up. You're like, I need to go fishing. <laughs> well, you know, conditions aren't quite right. We need some cloud cover. And you just like switch a button. I would just switch my backyard to summer year round. <laughs> Especially in Michigan. Yes. Well, th- today's guest, Brandon Bales, who is a self-proclaimed fiberglass junkie, uh, is going to talk to us. And big shout out to Chris Barclay, who gave us um, Brandon's information. But he, he he works for NASA, and they have a radiation gun. Yeah, I saw that. I heard that as well. That is, that's fascinating. And he talks about, yeah, he talks about that in the interview. I mean, can you imagine getting your hands on one of those things? I, I would be dangerous. I would do, I'd be doing it to people for fun. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear it's it Elon Musk Elon Musk interview on Joe Rogan? I saw bits of it. It was controversial. It was pretty controversial, but he talked about they have a flamethrower that they're selling. I saw that. And that was crazy. I kind of want that too. I kind of want that. I think they're all <laughs> sold out, but it was like, okay. That's how you start the fire. That's how you that's how you light the fire for sure. Well, welcome to the podcast. Let's light the fire. Well, today on the Remote No Pressure podcast, I'm very excited because I have with me Mr. Brandon Bells. Thank you very much for joining us, Brandon. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, well, I got your information from Chris Barclay, and he's like, dude, you have to you have to talk to Brandon. Um, and so we just want to say thanks, big shout out to, to Chris and uh, for, for introducing us. But I want to reach out to you because I know that you have, you are a fiberglass junkie. Am I correct? Oh, yeah, big time. <laughs> That's an understatement, I think. Now, is that a self-proclaimed title, or do you have to earn, like, how how does one become a fiberglass junkie? You know, <laughs> that's a good question. I've never really thought about it. You know, I think um, when I finally, you know, you go through this phase where you first start fly fishing, you just want to catch some fish, then you go through this, it's like the cycle of a fisherman almost. You go through phase where you want to catch big fish and then as many as you can. And then to me, it's sort of, you know, the natural thing was like, well, you know, I've caught some nice fish. I've caught a lot of different fish, but for the waters I fish and, you know, me and you were just talking beforehand, we're both, you know, uh, fathers, you've got limited time, you know, with kids and I've got all these streams close by and, uh, I would want to fish those. A lot of times the fish aren't the biggest, but you still want to have fun. And, uh, the fiberglass, man, it's, uh, all about the, the bend. I think, (laughs) I, I sort of think you become addicted to the, you know, the feel and the bend of that, uh, glass rod because it's, 
it's that uh, all the feedback, you know, um, you get when a fish is on compared to, and there's a place for fast graphite, but um, in a lot of the stiff, fast graphite, you just don't get that. So I think I just got addicted to that, that feel and the bend of that fiberglass rod, and then it's all all downhill from, from there. <laughs> now, did you start out on a fiberglass rod, or what kind of rod did you start fishing with? Yeah, um, so the very first fly rod that I got as a kid my granddad, um, he didn't actually buy it for me. I think I did some chores and earned the money uh, for the rod. But it was an old Shakespeare that I picked up at a, a local little, not, well, sort of like a hardware store in town. And it was a glass rod. And, you know, I think that does have something to do with it because, like I said, as I got older, I, you know, and you see a lot of the, the ads and the... Uh, uh, fly fishing magazines for these awesome fast you know graphite rods which like i said have a place but um you know i, I went to those thinking that's what i needed but in the end like I said, it's like a full circle i went back to the to the glass just because uh, of the feel and also probably because that's what i started out on now, do you still have that Shakespeare rod? Uh, it's somewhere. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I think you know. It's it's one of those things. I think it's down in my granddad's barn. Maybe I, I'm not totally sure. After the you know, I fished that thing so much, the uh, the cork grip started to deteriorate, and it just sort of fell all the pieces. I mean, for what it was <laughs> worth, it was a. <laughs> a cheap outfit, but for a 13-year-old kid, it was, you know, the the, the nicest rod I'd ever owned. Um, but it was very well used. I could probably, I should probably try to find it and get Chris to put a new grip on it just for a old time sake, just to have. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's somewhere around. I, I do need to dig it up, though. Well, hope you guys are enjoying the interview with Brandon. What an awesome interview. I wanted to touch base with you for a second this week as we approach Thanksgiving. It's such an awesome time of year in America where we actually take time on th- this coming Thursday and think about all the things that we're thankful for. Gratitude goes a very, very long way. One of the guests I've had on my podcast in the past was Mr. Paul Puckett, who is an artist, and he also owns the company Flood Tide. And I cannot tell you how just gracious he was and just grateful for the opportunity that he's had in this awesome sport of fly fishing. This this Friday is Black Friday and Monday is Cyber Monday. And I just want to encourage you to go check out floodtideco.com and check out some of the things that they have there. And because you listen to the podcast and subscribe to our mailing list, you get a 25% discount when you enter remote no pressure at checkout. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Let's get back to the podcast. Um, we have never had a NASA um, engineer. Um, now, you're a NASA engineering technician. Is that different than a re- that an engineer? Or what, what exactly is your role there at NASA? What, what do you do? So, um, so an engineering technician, basically we're a technician um, is the person who does a lot of the hands-on, which our engineers do a lot of hands-on, but we're, we do the, they do a lot of the designing and then we go in and do the actual fabricating or building up of what they, uh, what they need or what they want. And the particular group I work for is called the C team, S E E. It's the space environmental effects team. And, uh, it's pretty neat because we, we have customers, um, not just NASA customers, but outside companies come to us and say, hey, you know, I've got this solar panel, and I want to know what it, what will happen to it when it's exposed to, you know, this far out in the space atmosphere, and it's this much closer to the sun. So we can actually go in, and we have these vacuum chambers that sort of mimic um, the space environment, and we have 
this is going to sound real sci-fi, but we have <laughs> uh, radiation guns that we can shoot their their material, their object, whatever piece of equipment they want to test. We can shoot it with the exact radiation dose that it would receive in outer space. So, uh, and we can do it at a pretty advanced rate. So you can see over, you know, what would take say a year in outer space, we can do in a matter of weeks. Um, so it's, uh, like I said, it sounds a little sci-fi, but it's, <laughs> it's something unique and different almost, uh, every month. That's, that's incredible. Let me ask you this question, Brandon. How did you, how did you end up doing that? I mean, that's kind of an unusual job <laughs> using radiation <laughs> yeah. guns on, you know, on these things. Like, how do you end up, you know, this guy, are you, you're from Alabama, right? Originally? Yeah. Yeah. I'm born and raised. Right? You can probably tell from some people say I have a little, little bit of an accent. I'm sure you can, uh, <laughs> can, uh, pick that up. But yeah, I was born and raised, um, Right here in Alabama, in North Alabama, I'm about 20 minutes from the Tennessee state line. Um, but as far as how did I get started, uh, that's, you know, I, I wonder that at times, how, <laughs> how I got to uh, NASA. But no, um, I went to, right out of high school, I started working and um, going to a local college. Didn't know what I wanted to do and actually started out going to be a history teacher that was sort of my believe it or not my dream job i was like i want to be a teacher i remember i had this cool football coach that was my history teacher i was like man i want to do that for a living um (laughs) but uh you know as time went on i had always been there's sort of a split in what i like to do there's an artistic side to me and then there's a technical side and I was thinking on the more technical side, I'm like, well, I want to do something technical maybe. So I uh, enrolled in a different program at the college and started taking uh, robotics and instrumentation courses. And um, to be honest, most of the guys that were in those classes, um, they, they didn't really they finished up the robotics or they finished up the instrumentation. And in North Alabama, we have a lot of, uh, uh, I won't say factories, but there's a big industry for, you know, everything from Remington firearms to Polaris four wheelers. I mean, you name it, there's just a little bit of everything. Um, and that's what a lot of those guys did. They went just to get that knowledge so they could go and work, say maintenance in a lot of these places in more of an industrial atmosphere. Um, but luckily about halfway through the robotics courses, I was picked up or I had an opportunity to go work for uh, Pratt and Whitney uh, Robotics. They had a robotics division here where I live. And uh, it, I knew it was going to be a temporary job, but I knew it was going to be a great experience. So I took on the job and honestly, it, it, it sort of snowballed from that point forward. Um, I went from Pratt & Whitney to Northrop Grumman. At Northrop Grumman, I worked on, believe it or not, night vision scopes. I did the calibrating on some of the power supplies and the night vision scopes. And then from there, I went to Teledyne Brown Engineering and worked on... Um, some modules that were going to be shipped somewhere out in the Midwest. I'm not exactly sure, but it was for a um, power plant, and it was a uranium enrichment module, <laughs> which I never got to see the thing work. Like I said, it's really, really odd how all these things fell together. Um, but yeah, I went to work there, and that job basically was a, it was a contract deal, so. When I saw the contract coming to an end, uh, I lucked up and I had some some friends that worked on the military base where uh, NASA has a center here uh, in Huntsville and uh, was able to start working out there for a company. The company I worked for is actually ERC and we, ERC Incorporated, 
uh, host all the technicians and some of the lower level um, electrical mechanical engineer support for this NASA center. So, um, so yeah, uh, and how I got with the group I'm with, it was just uh, a matter of, hey, they needed somebody, are you willing to learn? And I said, sure, that sounds neat, radiation guns and <laughs> all this other stuff. <laughs> It'll be interesting, so... <laughs> That's awesome. And they didn't issue you like a Star Trek uniform like when you when you, when you <laughs> got mean, trained. You know, and that's the thing too. Uh, there's there's definitely a, I, you know at times I, I wondered like why did nobody want this job, and and I'll admit at first I was sort of leery because you hear the word radiation. I'm like, oh well, am I going to come out of work one day with a third arm or you know what, what's going to what's going to happen here? <laughs> But, but, you know, they're, the, the guys, you know, they're so strict with the, um, the guidelines for the exposure that, uh, we don't even get near, uh, well, for one, we're never even near anything when it's, when it's happening, we're remotely controlling all this stuff. But, um, honestly, I think a lot of times, and I've seen it, we'll have people stop by to deliver mail to us and. We have these ominous red flashing lights outside our uh, the front of our building when there's radiation testing going, mm-hmm. and I've seen people pull in and turn right back around, and leave <laughs> leave the parking lot, you know, because <laughs> you know because they don't they don't know any different. But right. um, I I think maybe that's how I, I fell fell in place there <laughs> was I was just willing to uh, to try it out. Now here's here's kind of an off the wall question for you, Brandon. Um, uh-huh. can, can, uh, NASA control the weather? Oh, uh, you know, believe it or not, I've been asked that question <laughs> really? at least twice. <laughs> I was just kind of joking around. Are you serious? I'm being dead serious. Oh I've been gosh. asked but, uh, on top of other things, you know, of course I get the alien question, you oh, know, yeah, yeah. Does, does, does NASA really, you know, do they know about <laughs> aliens or, you know, have they made contact? I'm like, Look, I'm I'm in a building with five people. I'm sort of isolated. You know, I don't know, like, what's going on. <laughs> so you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> so there's a chance. But, you know, as far as NASA controlling the weather, uh, it's funny because we're on this big military base, and seriously, for whatever reason, well, I know what the reason is. It's the way storm systems come in. And being in North Alabama, you've got these pop-up, thunderstorms, you know, and right afterwards it's 100% humidity because, you know, it's, it's just hot here and humid. Mm-hmm. Um, but where we're positioned, we get, most of the time, NASA, the NASA center will get just pounded with rain and thunderstorms, and then it sort of dries up when it goes, gets across the street to the Army side. So... I don't know. I don't know if they, I can't say that they control it, you know, if they do, not that well. <laughs> well, I, let's go back to what you were saying earlier um, about you have a side of you that is creative, but you also have a very technical side. Uh-huh. And you're not just like a fly angler. You are really deep into the culture. You're deep into fly tying. You're really deep into this thing, you know. Do you think you're oh, so yeah. deep into this because it matches that part of you? I mean, there's a there's a real strong technical part to fly fishing, especially fly tying, and there's there's also the the creative side as well. Do you think that's what attracts you so much to fly fishing? And I think in all honesty, I think my, my wife is thankful <laughs> for the <laughs> for the fly time part because um, for uh, when we were talking beforehand, I told you that I've always done well. I've always done something outdoors, and I went through a phase before kids and and growing up through high school, did a lot of hunting, uh, mostly bow hunting. Um, and you know, to be honest, there wasn't really so. That was fun. That was great, but there was no. I couldn't get out the artistic side of. You know, I did the thing where I would make my own arrows and all that, but you can only do so much, or at least I could. Right. Um, right. But I needed some type of creative outlets, and uh, yeah, I, the fly time definitely 
does that for me. And it, in all honesty, it's a stress reliever for me. Um, and and there's uh, I don't want to get real serious here, but um, the winter time can be really tough for me because I I um, have suffered at times from uh, I don't I've never been diagnosed. There's a there's a disorder called seasonal affective disorder where sure. you know the seasons can really affect your mood and for whatever reason I've always been greatly affected by that um in all honesty i would say that that the the fly time in the mid in the dead of winter when i can't get on the water um really saves <laughs> my sanity because <laughs> i mean you know not only is it a stress reliever but i'm you know i can sit down and it's almost like you go into your own world i can sit down and it can be 20 degrees outside and i can sit down with some deer hair and spin up a, a bass bug and the whole time I'm dreaming about or imagine some special trip I had in the middle of summer and it sort of takes you away for a little bit, you know, it's, it's a little escape. Um, so yeah, it's definitely fly time and, and, it's, and technical too. I mean, there, I'm a sort of a material quarter. I, I, any new material that comes out, I usually at least have to grab one pack of whatever it is um, just to try it out, just to, you know, add some flair to a pattern that I've, you know, tied or used for years. Um, there's always something new to try out, and it could affect the action of the fly. It may not. It might just be for looks, but it's always there's always something new to try, and that's that's a really good thing for me. Um, because there's always always something new coming out. <laughs> there is. There's always something for sale. Always something new. Oh yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Now you started you started fly fishing at a very early age. Why do you think you waited till you were an adult to start tying flies? You know, I, I don't know. I, I've wondered that myself. I mean, you know, like I said, I. You know, I fished my whole life, started fly fishing, or I got my first fly rod around the age of 12, 13. And it wasn't a constant thing. I would, you know, pick up my fly rod here and there. Um, and then, like, you know, as an adult, and when I had kids, and I basically, uh, I hadn't stopped hunting all the way, but I had slowed down a whole lot. Um, I just, uh, I don't know... And, you know, it's the thing, work wasn't really, there wasn't any undue stress or anything that would make me, oh, i got to, you know, get something out. But the only thing I can think of is, and I'm just now thinking of this somewhat, is I used to, my whole life I've always drawn or I did some painting, mostly drawing and sketching. Um, I, I quit doing that uh, probably around the time that I started at least a year or two before I started tying flies. Um, and also, as uh, trying to be thrifty as a, as a newlywed, I, I got tired <laughs> of <laughs> buying flies at the fly shop, you know, and, and spending this money. But, you know, like I just got done saying, I buy a pack of whatever new material comes out. I don't think I'm saving money at this point. <laughs> but... Um, but early on, I would say that played a part in it. Because, and two, um, you know, you, you you would get a fly out of a big box store or a fly shop, and you would use it, and I would look at it and say, well, that's really cool. I wonder how they did that. So, of course, YouTube. I started looking at YouTube videos, and uh, I actually had an old book um, that I had never read from when I was younger that had a bunch of – it was a book about uh, panfish. And fly fishing for, you know, a different type of panfish. And that's what I did a lot of growing up. Um, I just enjoy it. And I, that's honestly, that's probably the majority of what I do now. Or if I just want to go have fun, that's what I fish for now. Um, but I found that book and I remember looking through it and thinking, well, you know, I've seen how they do a woolly bugger and I see how this pattern looks. So maybe I should go get these materials and I, Went and bought the materials and bought a, a cheap uh, vice, uh, I think from, I think I got one from maybe Cabela's, I can't remember. 
and just started uh, tinkering around and and tying. And before I knew it, it was you know I had to had to tie a few every day after work. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's great. I totally get that. I mean, as far as seasonal effectiveness disorder, I live in Michigan, so. Um, after the holidays, January, February, and March, can you can get some pretty dark days mentally? Oh yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Now you had mentioned earlier that your dream job was to be a history teacher. Is there a uh, a certain type of history that you um, wanted to teach, or was that just because your coach was a history teacher? Yeah, you know. Um, I honestly, to be perfectly honest, I think it was just because my coach was a history teacher. Sure. But, uh, I mean, it, it was, uh, but as far as all the subjects go, um, history was my favorite subject. I mean, no, there's no, really, I don't have a, a, a favorite time period um, or anything like that or any certain, I mean, I, I always loved uh when we would study World War One, World War Two, and uh, even the Vietnam and the Korean War, um, because I had family that served in World War Two and the Korean War, um, both of my grandfathers, and I always I sort of dove into those a little bit just because I wanted to see what maybe my grandfathers went through, what they experienced, you know what. I wanted to know all, I'm, you know, being detail oriented. I wanted to know, you know, what all went on during that period. What were they exposed to this and that? Um, but yeah, but as far as, you know, it, it was my favorite subject. And like I said, I had a, a pretty cool, uh, football coach <laughs> that was a teacher. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Now, the reason I ask is because we've had a lot of guides and a lot of people in the industry who have come on this show and it seems like nine times out of 10, every fishing guide that we've had on has been some kind of teacher educator. And, um, that's why I was just curious if that was something you were passionate about for some reason, you know, and and I've talked to a lot of, of guides, um, and they all say Mm -hmm. the same thing. You've got to have a heart of a teacher to be a really good fishing guide. And I could totally see that, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's why you said that because yeah. Um, I have two, I have two buddies that, um, live close, well, not close by, they're in another state, but they, uh, they're both teachers <laughs> and that's, you know, that's, that's what they, they do and they don't guide full time. Well, one did at one point, but he went back to teaching and the other one is the exact opposite. He started teaching and then went to guiding. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely something there. I think it's, like I said, it's, uh, a mindset and how your heart set on uh, having that, uh, you know, that aptitude to, to want to teach people to be a guide. Absolutely. Now, um, are you teaching your boys to fish? Or are they at that age yet? Or yeah. So um, my twelve-year-old. The er, let me say this early on. I, there's a guy that I don't work with him anymore. He he works. He still works at NASA. He's a technician. Um, he works in another building now. But it's funny. He gave me some advice a long time ago. We were talking back and forth, and uh, I said something about, yeah, my, at the time, I can't remember. It, it's my oldest son. He, I would take him fishing, and he would, he would be good, you know, it, as long as we caught a fish in the first five minutes. <laughs> if nothing happened in the first five minutes, he was ready to go, and I sort of, got, I admit, I sort of got a little frustrated, and I was like, yeah, I just don't understand. How do I get him to stay? And my buddy at work, he said, look, man, he said, I'm going to tell you from my experience, because he has older grown, grown-up sons now, and he said, you know, never, he said, if you're going to take your kids fishing, leave your your rod at home. You know, just take a rod just for them, and he said, and when they're ready to go, even if it's just been five minutes and you drove 30 minutes to the stream, just, just go. He said, trust me. He said, I wish I would have done that with, um, my three boys because neither one, one was sort of still into fishing or shooting or something. But anyway, he was basically saying, don't force them into it. So 
I never did. So after that point, I never did with my oldest. And he, he doesn't really, he's into baseball and basketball, which is great. Um, he's just not really into fishing at all. Now my seven year old, my wife actually has a picture and she gave me a copy of it for Father's Day one year. Um, I have a picture of me waist deep in a, a stream pretty close to our house. And uh, she, I don't know the name for it. She had some type of, it was a wrap that she would wear when she was walking around the house <laughs> doing housework. And she would have the baby stuffed down in this wrap. Right. Um, like on her chest. And she put that on me one day and I s- stuffed my little six month old son. Oh, he's maybe eight months old in the my, uh, front of my shirt or whatever and was toting him around in the stream. And, uh, it was funny. He, he had a blast. He never cried. He never whimpered. He was, you know, every fish I would catch, he would try to grab onto. I'd have to try to unhook the fish, you know, at arm's length away from my body. Sure. Um, but, but from day one, uh, that little dude, he, it, it upsets him if I leave early in the morning to go smallmouth fishing and he's, you know, and I didn't wake him up. And like I said, he's seven years old now. Um, uh, just this year, I started working with them on casting a fly rod. And uh, probably probably this Christmas, Santa Claus will bring a fly rod for him, <laughs> um, is what I'm thinking. Because he's actually already asked for one, uh, along with a ton of other stuff, of course. But... I think he's finally ready to use use a fly rod. Um, granted, it's and it and all honesty, not because I love fiberglass rods. It it it's going to be a, a glass rod just because. And this is another part that I love about fiberglass is it's extremely durable. Um, and I can only imagine what abuse he will. <laughs> you know, <laughs> put on this rod, so it's going to be a fiberglass rod, uh, right. just to hold up to his his abuse at, at the age he is. <laughs> but um, and I and you know, he he takes a small um, uh, spinning reel outfit now when we go, and he does great with it. He casts on his own. He hooks and hooks fish on his own. Uh, I took him and some of his buddies and their dads uh, about a month ago. Um, and he would volunteer to unhook the other, his buddy's fish, you know, <laughs> he, he's not, he's not afraid in the least bit. Uh, and, and when it's just me and him, sometimes I'll, I'll ask him, Hey, do you want to just bring my rod and I'll let you, you know, I'll cast for you, help you cast. And he's caught, you know, a few fish like that, uh, with the fly rod, me helping him out. But, uh, yeah, he, he loves it, man. He uh, and like I said, I've never, never forced him, and never really forced his older brother. Um, but like I said, my oldest, he's a good sport about it. If uh, if their their mom's at work, she, she's a uh, a nurse, a labor delivery nurse, and um, if she's on call and it's just me and them, he'll still tag along with us, and he might you know look around for crayfish or, or whatever else while we're waiting along fishing so he's a good sport about it well that's that's really really cool and that's i think that's some really good advice for parents out there too um about don't even take a ride for yourself because it's just gonna be frustrating you're you're there for the kids oh, yeah. you know <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah it is it is what one more question for you and this is very indulgent of me but i'm going to oh, ask okay. you this question um um what about donald trump's Everyone gets weird when you say that name. But what do you think about Donald Trump's Space Force, considering that you're in NASA? Are you guys getting any intel on that or not really? <laughs> um, no no intel on that. I have heard some jokes about that <laughs> at work. Um, you know, I don't I honestly don't know what to think about it. I mean, it's, you know, you. I've seen a lot of memes online, you know, on social media about it. Um whether he does that or not, and it, and it's and I've even heard uh, Mike Pence uh, speaking about it too. Um, you know, I, 
as far as, you know, the, just saying Space Force does sound sort of funny to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but I do. But then in a way, I'm like, you know, I see where having a agency or at least a division watching out for, you know, say the satellites that are orbiting or what's going on up there around the satellite. I can see that. I don't know if we need a whole division. I, I don't know. I, it's it's one of those things, like I said, that, and it's funny you ask because I really haven't heard a lot of real serious talk about, it. <laughs> you know, at work. It's, uh, you know, like I've seen some memes and heard some jokes and seen some T-shirts. They're not not in person, but online that people have made. So, <laughs> so, so I don't know. I guess I guess that's one we'll all have to see see what happens there. Um, you know, hey, maybe we'll get. Uh, you know, I'm I'm with the space environmental effects team. We might be testing some some new astronaut suits before long. Who knows? Yeah, you know? yeah. Who knows? That's all I was asking you. You know, you work for NASA. It seems like yeah. you'd be the logical recruit for that sort of thing. So, but yeah, yeah. So if we need to do some R and D on some equipment that needs to go up, I, you know, it'll probably come through us at some point. Well, please, for the love of whatever, <laughs> please, you have to let us know. Of course, if yeah. it's not, you know, confidential, we want to know when this thing's going to go yeah. down. I mean, I do, anyways. I think it's fascinating, but um, who knows? Maybe, oh, yeah. maybe we'll find some new fly tying material out of the whole deal. You know, uh, so, exactly. Yeah, so. you never know what you'll find. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brandon, man, I really appreciate you hanging out with us. Thank you very much for taking some time with us. If people wanted to get in touch with you. Uh, how would they do that, Brandon? Um, so, a lot of my stuff, uh, my, I do most of my stuff through Instagram. Um, if you were to go on Instagram, you could look up Panther Branch Bugs um, is my name on there. Uh, and as far as Facebook, just Brandon Bales. Um, locally, or I will tell you the truth, um, if guys wanted to see some of my fly patterns in person, um, most uh, I have a couple of fly patterns that are in the Orvis catalog. Um, there's the Bales Out Minnow and the Bales Panther Creek Hopper that Orvis carries. Um, so there's a couple of my patterns out. I've got uh, a couple more that I'm probably going to submit um, within the next year or so. Um, and you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens with those, but, uh, yeah, um, best thing to do is check out my Instagram. If you want to look at flies and, and fish all day, then hey, go, go take a look on my Instagram and it, and you know, that's, that's sort of, that's sort of where I put all my creative stuff and, uh, and yeah, you know, I, I, I'm just, uh, constantly putting stuff on on instagram so i usually update it um every week there's there's something new on there and uh uh there's always that'll be my my main outlet for people to to look at stuff well we'll put those um links up on 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 instagram to your instagram so okay, people cool. can find you. And and I'm looking at it now and I see that you have those corker boots with a boa tie, am I right? Yeah, yeah. I that's what I got. I just got those and oh my gosh, it's life changing. Those things oh, yeah, yeah. those things are amazing. And no, they don't sponsor the show, but holy cow, those things have changed my life. Oh, let me tell you, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm, uh, I'm I'm in no way affiliated with uh, with corker, but yeah, uh that Let's see, that's my second pair, uh, what, whatever updated model it is. I had to move up a model because my first one, they didn't make that model anymore. But, but I had, um, people are a little leery, I think, of that BOA system at times uh, because of the cable. But let me say that the first pair I had with the BOA system, um, I had them three and a half years before I finally... And the bus just never failed. It was me fishing, you know, three to four days a week. You know, it might not be long periods of time, but, you know, for three and a half years. And the boots finally 
they had just had it, and I needed to, <laughs> to update them. Yeah, I hear you. I, I have a prosthetic hip, and so I can't bend over and tie my left shoe. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I can bend. I can pull my leg behind me and like spin uh-huh. a s- spin a wheel. You know, yeah. so that Perfect. I mean, but before that, I'm like, what am I gonna do? I you know, so I always <laughs> bought like waders with boots installed. You know, and like that kind of thing. And which is great if you got like neoprenes for steelhead season or something. But when you got you know your breathables, you can't. You know, mm-hmm. you need some boots, and so. Yeah, I bought those things, man, and it's like I got four wheel drive out on the river. It's just, it's <laughs> awesome, man. Yeah. yeah, they're great, man. They really are. Well, thank you very much, Brandon. I'll let you get back to your life. You have a great night. All right, thanks, man. You too. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. What an awesome guest Brandon was. Be sure to check out our partner, Flood Tide, at floodtideco.com. Enter in remote no pressure at checkout and get a. 25% discount. Also, don't forget our website, remotenopressure.com. Check out some of our decals and listen to some old episodes. We'd love to have you. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Until next time, go fishing.